Kosani cabinet singing what a war. It really was the Bustamante uh, government's first clash with the Rastafari. And Mr. Bustamante he said, carrying all Rastaman dead or alive. Bringing all Rasta dead or alive. What book can hold, book he will hold them. When he said the jail can't hold them. So them from Bogil. Bogil is a cemetery in Mobile. That means to kill them. Back to history class. Alexandra Bustamante was such a evil and wicked Prime Minister back in the days for the Jamaican Labour Party. Alexandra Bustamante. People, you know what the people say? The man sent for every Rasta. Dead are alive. Dead are alive. And the man make sure to tell them say if that the cemetery they full up this up. We have more we can get them go. And who no one tell me say these people that say they are in green love black people. Eh? And you want to tell me say a man we say him a Rasta man support Jamaican Labour Party. And tell me, say, him a real Rasta man. No man, we grew a lax pan the middle. We support the Jamaican Labour Party. Is not a real Rasta man. Because the Jamaican Labour Party eat Rasta. Remember that. Remember that. So, that is a little bit more of history class. Back down there, in a time when the Jamaican Labour Party Chim all of the Rasta man, them kill as much as what them can kill. Holy for Rasta did not in tiny man. Holy holy both woman, man and pick me everybody man. You understand me? Say they are police and soldier. Just say take them out and bad man. Just say take them out. Yeah. But bless up to my viewers and my subscribers. Them. Me hope everybody having a blessed and a wonderful evening. Now my viewers and my subscribers, remember in everything you do. Always put God first in every uh, any situation. Just always remember to call upon God. Always remember to pray because a prayer day keep the devil away. Now, my viewers and my subscribers, we have a lot coming up inside this update, including Mark Golden press conference. So, people, you definitely don't want to miss it. So, leave a like on this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet, and turn on the post notification bell. For new content. Alright. We are going to run the intro. And come back. We soon forward. So welcome back. To my viewers. And my subscribers. Them. Big up to all of my viewers. Big up to all of my subscribers. Them. We continually support the channel. And help the channel to grow. Now. Remember to leave a like on this video. Remember to give this video a thumbs up. Also, if it's a new viewer's first time on my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and turn on the post notification bell. So whenever we drop new content, you will be first to be notified. Share the content with a friend, a family, a loved one. Share it on your social media platform. You understand? Now, people, so before we get into the Mark Golin press conference, people, let us take a look at... This story where the mother of Raniel Plummer, the 15 year old Irwin High School student who was fatally stabbed by another student yesterday, says she is struggling to cope with her son's death. It is reported that Raniel, Raniel was approached by a student he had an altercation with earlier in the day along with a group of boys who attacked him outside the school gate during the altercation a knife was used to stab Raniel in the chest so people why may i tell you say me no know what happened to these kids you know i don't know what happened to these kids nowadays but judge my condolences goes out to the family and friends and the loved one of Raniel because you know it never nice to last a loved one but people check out what the mother had to say people i don't know how am i gonna live without my my son i don't know me go manage without my son that is a house i don't want to live in that is a house anymore 
because we can imagine live living without Ranil. It's like my heart, I'm breathing and, and I am still alive, but me dead. My heart come out of my body. When the doctor him tell me so they couldn't save him, then do everything they could, but they couldn't save him because the knife went down too deep in his heart. So after the court ruling that the DPP Paul Llewellyn should leave office with immediate effect, Mark Golin did a press conference after and give out some valid information. So people, I am going to play this video because it's a very long video and I don't want to drown out the video too much with too much talking. So I am going to leave this video for you guys to watch it and leave your honest opinion down below in the comment section. Watch the video until the end because there is a lot of information inside this video. All right. Remember to leave a like on this video and subscribe. Yeah, thank you. Yes, welcome ladies and gentlemen, the members of the media. Thank you for um, being here for this press conference. We have convened this press conference because today is a significant day in the history of our country in relation to matters of governance and the democracy that we cherish. It is, of course, the day on which the Constitutional Court has ruled against the government on legislation that was rushed through Parliament, both through the House of Representatives and through the Senate, without the normal period for deliberation, rushed in due haste uh, for what we regard as a motive to ensure that the current DPP could remain in office for a longer period than the Constitution contemplated. We felt that the procedure that was embarked upon by the government was fundamentally wrong and the substance of what was being done was also invalid. And we decided to take the matter to the Constitutional Court for the court to rule on it. The reason we did this is because, first of all, as parliamentarians, we all swear an oath or affirm to uphold and defend the Constitution of the country. And we're living in times where we have a government which likes to play fast and loose with the constitutional rights of our citizens and with the normal principles of good democratic governance in the country. This is not the first occasion on which the opposition has had to play this role of assiduously guarding the constitution from a government that is intense on violating it in various ways. There were, for example, the NIDS case. The case of the NIDS legislation, which again was rushed through Parliament with undue haste when we warned the government that it violated constitutional rights of our citizens to privacy in the form in which it had been presented to Parliament. They chose to ignore our request to have that legislation be properly reviewed by a joint select committee, and we had to take it to court and the entire legislation was struck down by the Constitutional Court and the government had to wheel and come again and bring new legislation to deal with the question of a national ID. There, of course, are the states of emergency and the use of the states of emergency by this government, which we have said is not consistent with our Constitution and we have brought proceedings before the Constitutional Court to test their use of it and those are pending proceedings which will come to trial in due course. There's also an earlier test of the constitutionality of the state of emergency brought by a young man called Roshan Clark, where the court ruled in his favor and awarded substantial compensation because he had been detained on the state of emergency in circumstances which the court agreed were not in keeping with the Constitution. And there have been other instances, the attempt to appoint a Chief Justice on a probationary basis, unheard of in the history of Jamaica and indeed other jurisdictions, which civil society and ourselves objected to fundamentally as violating the separation of powers principle. 
where the Prime Minister took it on himself to think he had jurisdiction or power or authority to review the performance of a Chief Justice and decide whether or not he should continue in office. And before that, there were these undated letters of res resignation signed by JLP-appointed senators as an attempt to give the Prime Minister leverage over them in relation to the CCG legislation that was being brought by the then government of the People's National Party. And those were tested by two, I think it was, certainly one or two senators on their side when the letters were used by the Prime Minister to remove them. And that was held to be an improper device and a violation of the Constitution. So we have been vigilant in a variety of matters, and this most recent one is very, very important. It is groundbreaking because this was a bill to amend the Constitution that they passed, and the basis upon which it was challenged was because we felt that the way in which it was seeking to do this was both for an improper motive, but also was in violation of the constitutional arrangements to do with how a DPP um, can have her tenure in office extended. As you know, the current DPP had received a three-year extension prior to her 60th birthday in accordance with the procedure that the Constitution provides, and the Governor General approved of that extension. And the, her tenure of office should have ended in September last year, which was the end of that three-year period. The government, for reasons which one can only speculate about, sought in July last year, just before the summer break, to rush through this legislation, to extend, the, to amend the Constitution, not only to say that future DPPs and Auditors General would retire at the age of 65 rather than 60, but also to apply that to the existing incumbent. And it, that is where they violated the Constitution. And that attempt was struck down today by the Constitutional Court. It is quite clear that the tenure of the existing officer that has been holding that position since September last year came to an end, that the attempt to extend it was invalid and unconstitutional. And I therefore call upon the Services Commission to proceed with alacrity to embark on the process for appointing a new DPP, the advertising, etc., should be done. And in the meantime, that the Governor General acting on their advice, the Services Commission advice, should appoint somebody to act in the position. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just part of what has been happening in our country in terms of gross violations of the normal precepts of good parliamentary democracy and good governance. We know about, for example, the situation in our parliament in relation to the former clerk who on the eve of her retirement, after decades of service to the parliament and to the people of Jamaica as clerk to the House of Parliament, was the recipient of a letter which wasn't a private affair, but was emailed to all parliamentarians and became public immediately, castigating her, criticizing her in relation to the issue of how reports, which come to parliament from the Auditor General in this case, were being dealt with, and saying that she had committed essentially a disciplinary infraction by not carrying out the ruling of the speaker and that the letter would be put on her file. As it turned out, the speaker had to back down on that issue of those reports, and they were indeed, when the Auditor General sent them back to Parliament, the reports having been returned to the Auditor General, when they came back to Parliament, they had to be tabled, and they were tabled. And they were terrible in circumstances which are inconsistent with that ruling, a ruling which we think is flawed, and we've said so all along, and we are calling once again for the opinion of the Attorney General's chambers on this matter, which we've been asking for for months and months, to be released to all parliamentarians so we can see what the Attorney General's Chamber said about the procedure for tabling reports. And this is a matter 
which we will be looking at closely as to whether we're going to have to take this matter to the court for a ruling as well. But in the meantime, we're asking once again for this legal opinion to be released. That opinion is not an opinion belonging to the Speaker. The Speaker acts on behalf of Parliament in seeking the legal advice of the Attorney General on a matter that affects all members of Parliament, and indeed all parliamentarians, including the Senate. And the opinion that was granted or issued by the Attorney General should be shared with all parliamentarians so we can see what the principal legal advisor to the government has said on this matter. And ladies and gentlemen, I would also just mention there are other issues that we have been raising of grave concern. The role of the political ombudsman and the way in which that has been conflated into the Electoral Commission of Jamaica, making the Electoral Commissioners collectively as a body the political ombudsman is a flawed approach. We objected to it when the legislation was brought to Parliament and it was rushed through again in, with indecent haste. And of course, it has not worked because the local government elections have come and gone and they were unable to effectively play any role in dealing with the kind of issues that the political ombudsman is established to deal with. Issues which are highly contentious um, often involve partisan considerations and which ought not to be brought under the ECJ, which is a body established to ensure consensus between the major political parties on electoral matters so as to reduce tensions and ensure that our democracy can function in a way that is in keeping with good governance, law and order, and a peaceful society. Coming out of a history that we are all aware of, where political violence was a big problem in this country in the past. So this is another issue where we feel the government has gone down a very wrong path. But they are stubborn and headstrong. And it is only when we take them to court and win there that they have to reconsider, wheel, and come again, as was done with NIDS and as will have to be done with the DPP. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, my two colleagues. Senator Scott Markley, Member of Parliament Philip Fogel, who was one of the two co-applicants in the case. The case was brought by our leader of opposition business in the House, Philip Fogel MP, and our leader of opposition, opposition business in the Senate, Senator Peter Bunting, who is unable to be with us this afternoon. Uh, and, but it was a, a case that was brought to uphold and defend the constitution of the country principles of good governance and to avoid the manipulation of the power of the majority and the tyranny of the majority in Parliament to undermine good governance in this country. And that is something that we will consistently and strenuously resist as opposition in accordance with our duty to the people of Jamaica. Thank you. All right, so we are opening the floor for questions. Uh, uh, opposition leader, the Justice Minister says the government intends to appeal. If they get a stay of the court order, what do you think the DPP should do? It, meaning, uh, should she take leave pending the appeal or would it be okay with her continuing in office? Well, the legal advice that we have received today is that this is a declarative judgment that the court, the constitutional court has been made and there's no jurisdiction to grant a stay of a declarative judgment. You can appeal it but it stands as a declaration of what the law is, unless and until a higher court rules otherwise. So our position is that the DPP, or Ms. Llewellyn, is no longer the DPP, and it has in fact not been the DPP since her 63rd is it, birthday, September last year. There is a provision in the Constitution, I think it's section 96 of section two, that would validate her acts as DPP between then and now, but now that the ruling has been made, she can no longer um, hold herself out or perform functions as a DPP. And a new DPP, a new DPP should be appointed um, in accordance with the, the procedures which have been established for that, and somebody needs to be appointed to act as DPP in the interim. So what should happen come Monday then, following on from what you're saying? I would say that what should happen is that the the Services Commission should recommend to the Governor-General quickly to appoint somebody to act as DPP. 
And that's quite normal. It happens frequently when the incumbent DPP has to go on leave or whatever. That should be applied and done quickly. We've already received information about disruption in proceedings in a court in St. Anne already where the judge brought proceedings to a halt. Uh, to what extent, because the person representing the DPP's office, uh, she had concerns about them. Let me just quickly uh, read what our correspondent sent there. Um, senior attorney, uh, Oswald Smith, who was in the middle of a bail application, the trial judge said both him and the lead prosecutor uh, they had to stand on because of the new development. To what extent are you concerned with the uncertainty that this now creates in the DPP's office? It's highly undesirable that there should be continuing uncertainty in the, in, in the DPP's office. Indeed, that uncertainty has, ex has existed from the legislation was brought to Parliament in July last year, and we pointed out why we thought it was invalid and unconstitutional. And the court has, in, has approved that and has um, upheld the submissions to that effect. And obviously, any continuing uncertainty is highly undesirable. The court system must continue to function. There are many, many cases in the system that need to be dealt with in, in accordance with proper procedures and due alacrity. And that is why I think that it's important that the Service Commission and the Governor General quickly appoint somebody to act. And they're very capable persons within the DPP's office, senior prosecutors who can, put, uh, who can act competently until a new DPP is appointed in accordance with the Constitution. What implications do you think this might have, sir, on cases that the DPP would have been involved in since the extension? As I said before, I believe those are validated, and those acts are validated by virtue of Section 96, subsection 2 of the Constitution, which specifically has that effect. Now that the court has ruled that the incumbent is not, is not the DPP and has not been since September last year, that can no longer be applied to validate anything going forward and a new person must be appointed to act until a new DPP is duly appointed. But in the period from the date on which her tenure really ended in September last year and the ruling of the court today, I believe that those actions on her part would have been validated by the Constitution, Section 96, Subsection 2. And that's the advice we have received. We spoke about what the Services Commission needs to do. Mm -hmm. How about Ms. Lulin, what are you calling on her to do at this point? Well, <laughs> my own view is that, you know, it is highly undesirable that somebody should hold office as DPP in this country, knowing that his or her tenure uh, is a matter of grave concern to the opposition of the country. It is not a good thing for the office of the DPP to be in any way politically contentious. And I think that in light of today's ruling, uh, Ms. Llewellyn ought to stand down and should you know, not seek to make an effort um, to continue to hold that office in light of the ruling that the court has made today. You spoke about appointing a new DPP, at least in the interim for the new DPP, uh, what do you think the process should be? I know you mentioned earlier that the post should be advertised, but if that is not done, then what? I believe that there's an established procedure as to how a, a DPP is appointed. I believe there may be some guidelines and so on, and we expect that those will be followed. Indeed, my understanding is that when an attempt was made early in 2023, for an extension to be granted, and that came before the Service Commission, and they pointed out that there was no possibility of it being further extended. They had indicated their intent to proceed with advertising um, the position so that a new DPP could be appointed by September when the incumbent would no longer be in office. But that was, to some extent, um, oh, superseded by this legislation that the government rushed to Parliament, which has now been struck down. And people would like to make a statement. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to start by placing on record my appreciation to our legal team. Yes. But that was, to some extent, um, headed by Michael Hilton and the Impactor team for the tremendous work that they were able to do to enable today's significant victory. Um, we have been at pains to say that this was a fundamental legal point. 
and that really the current DPP wasn't the subject of this issue, but rather the broader legal principle. I have been in Parliament for 29 years, and there is a, a way for the democracy to work. If you're an opposition of 14 or 31, you're an opposition, and respect is due. And we have found that that has not been the case since, since 2020, where little or no respect is given to the opposition. In fact, the government has removed our oversight yeah, position in relation to most of the committees, and we're again calling on the government to restate, replace the chairmanship of these committees with the opposition. There is a role for the leader of the opposition, and the court was unequivocal in that regard today. We are lamenting some of the recent incidents in Parliament. The leader has just mentioned about the speaker's letter to the former clerk. We are insisting that that letter be withdrawn and the appropriate apology. Um, be given in, in public. Yeah. Um, so we are pleased that the role of the opposition, which is really the guardian of the Constitution, has really come to the fore this time. And uh, we um, believe that there are some other issues that would have to be pursued in similar way. I want to join with Member Paulwin in first of all thanking the legal team for the tremendous work which they have done. And singling out perhaps uh, Mike Hilton Casey, who has been the lead in a number of constitutional actions which we have taken and others which are pending. This administration believes that because they have been elected, it is their sole duty to govern and they need not listen to anybody at all. This has been their shortcoming, it has been their failing, and there are other matters pending, apart from these that are behind us, which will demonstrate the folly of their ways. I want to call on them on this occasion to stop hiding behind legislation. And I refer in particular to the use of the Data Protection Act by the Tax Administration Department on a matter which firstly, there was hesitation to table in the parliament, and secondly, now that the media has requested further information, they are being refused. That is not good governance. It is not good governance when you, take, you table a bill and debate it immediately. The country deserves to have their parliamentarians scrutinize legislation to ensure that when it's passed, it is fair, it is just, and it will be upheld by the courts. And I am saying here today that there are several pieces of legislation which give me, in my capacity as shadow spokesperson for justice, gives me great concern. The Farms Act is one that I have spoken about time and time again, and I have pointed out that not only do I doubt its constitutionality in certain areas, but certainly it does not serve justice well because it is creating a backlog in the courts where persons are refusing to play, plead guilty. And why would they? If they plead guilty, it's the same 15 years as if they are tried and sentenced to 15 years. And it was under Mark Golden as Minister of Justice that the Criminal Justice Administration Act was amended to permit those people who pleaded guilty to get what we call a discount on their sentence, so that the courts would be able to take that into account, and which defense counsel, such as myself, would be able to say to a client, let's, let's be guilty because we know that you won't have to serve the full time. I, I am imploring the public to take a good look at what is happening in Parliament and, and at the, the constant consternation which takes place now since, the, since certain changes have been made, not just with the chairmanship, but look at how they walked out on their own government when the, when the leader of opposition who had was representing 
52% of the people were speaking. These are very important things. Never before in the history of the parliament did you see a government walking out on its people, its duties, and its responsibilities. And since then, it has been spiraling down. I have every confidence that a leader of opposition who believes strongly in the principles of law, the principles of good governance, and the principles of accountability will fix that, those things when the time comes. Mr. Golding, you said in no uncertain terms that the motive behind the extension of DPP, Paul Llewellyn, was improper. Explain what you mean by that. What I would say to that is that to apply that legislation to an incumbent who was facing imminent retirement indicated that the motivation for doing it and the way in which it was rushed through was primarily about trying to maintain that individual in the office. And I'm not going to get into why that may have been the case in terms of what was their thinking as to why this was so critical. They have said what they have to say on that at the time. I don't find it convincing at all. But I think the way in which it was done speaks for itself. And I also want to just publicly acknowledge the legal team that took on this matter, led by Michael Hilton, King's Counsel, for their professionalism and their erudition and their willingness to take cases like this really in the interest of good governance of the country. This is not and should not be reviewed as or looked on as a victory for a political cause or a political party. This is a victory for people of Jamaica and the good governance of the country and the upholding of our constitution, which is the seminal document that ensures that the rights of our people are protected. And I think it's very important that we say that on, on the record so that the people will regard this appropriately. Thank you. Siobhan Campbell. Mr. Golding, you, according to Mr. Paul Will, this was not about the holder of the office, but both you and your predecessor have raised concerns about the holder of the office. Mm -hmm. Had it been someone else in the position, would you have pursued the same course? Yes, we would have, because the issue was not primarily about who the incumbent was, but was the way in which it was done and how it was essentially bypassing an established constitutional procedure which was very clear and had good reasons behind it uh, in a way which the Constitution never contemplated. Yes, it is true that my predecessor, um, when the original extension of, 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 of uh, request for an extension of, of the DPP's term of office um, came up, had said that they, we didn't support it and the reasons were put in writing and so on. But I don't want this to be about that individual. I want this to be about the principle at stake. It's clear the government does not intend to back down and intends to push this further into an appeal. It could go as far as the Privy Council. Is the PNP ready to continue this? Absolutely. This is a point of principle. The court has ruled in a way which we think is correct and that upholds the issue and the concern and the cause that led us to bring these proceedings in the first place. And to the extent that it's appealed, we will be vigorously defending that at the appellate courts, whether it be Court of Appeal in Jamaica or the highest court, which still unfortunately, because we have not managed to fully decolonize, sits in a foreign land. And then just two final points. You have suggested that the DPP's current tenure, regardless of any appeal, is untenable. What is that an end? It has ended. What if Madam Llewellyn decides to stay in the post? I don't want to um, speculate on that issue. I think in light of paragraph 172 of the judgment handed down today, that would be a most unwise thing for Madam Llewellyn, Miss Llewellyn to, to do. And you know, I hope she doesn't um, seek to, to do that. And then just finally, mm -hmm. the matter of the Auditor General's reports and the Integrity Commission reports as well. As you've noted, the Speaker of the House has sort of backed away from her initial position. Does the PNP see a need, if potentially, to bring it further to say a court as you have done in this matter? We may, we may well, because the position that was taken in relation to the two reports, the one on the tax administration 
Jamaica and the other on the FSC. Uh, and her fine, you know, final inclination to table them was as a result of immense pressure that was being brought to do that. She has not said, the speaker has not said that the ruling which she gave last, late last year no longer applies. And that suggests to me that they will continue to seek to be able to delay the tabling of reports. And I must tell you that I believe the motivations behind that are entirely political. And I think it's quite wrong. So to the extent that this matter remains unclear and uncertain, we may have to seek clarity on it. I know, why not settle this in the Standing Orders Committee? I realize there was a meeting scheduled, I believe it was last week, which did not happen. Why not settle it there? The reason for that is that the, the basis upon which the ruling has purported to be made is not to do with the standing orders. It's purport, it purports to rely on an interpretation of actual legislation, which we feel um, has been wrongly interpreted, which is why we want to see the Attorney General's opinion, because we don't think that the Attorney General's opinion supports that ruling. If, if it did, I'm sure we would have seen it back when the ruling was made. The fact that there, there's this prolonged resistance to share with the Parliament and the members of Parliament the opinion of the Attorney General's chambers on a matter very important to the Parliament is abhorrent, poor governance, and should not be allowed to stand. But I, I, should, I should have said though in relation to the Standing Orders Committee that we are going to be present at that committee sitting. Uh, we have some far-reaching proposals to make, especially in relation to the role of the Speaker. Um, the government is a majority, and I suspect we might not be successful, but we're going to press for a substantial amendment um, to the standing orders and to allow the opposition. There are some issues, for example, private members' motion. It's Jackson, the party leader. We have been trying to get the opposition to initiate certain things. Those have been totally strongly pre prevented by the government. There is a role for the opposition. And I don't believe that enough uh, credence is given, and some changes will have to be made to allow for the opposition to have greater say in the running of the parliament and in advancing legislation to better neighbor people. Five reports were sent to the parliament this week from the Interim Commission. Parliament is now on break. What would be the posture of the opposition once uh, parliament resumes? Parliament has been convened to sit on Tuesday. We will see what happens then. Uh, my understanding is that those five reports should be tabled. We don't know what the contents of the, uh, of the reports are, what issues they address, but they must be tabled so they become public documents. That's what we require. I would just add to what our Leader of Opposition Business in the House said, that we have impeachment legislation, which was tabled by me as Leader of Opposition a couple of years ago. It was a JLP manifesto promise to bring impeachment legislation within 180 days of them being elected in 2016. They didn't do it. And after the George Wright affair and the beating of a lady with a stool in a car park, I saw the need to bring it forth. And it has been tabled. I have been seeking to have it referred to a joint select committee so that it can be properly reviewed and public persons of interest or people who have an interest in it can come to Parliament and speak to it so we can have good legislation and a good impeachment procedure. I have been unable to get that bill to move anywhere. Okay, we'll take the final question from TikTok. Uh, this person is asking, if the Prime Minister made a request, will you agree on an extension of the DPP's tenure? <laughs> no, I would not. The Prime Minister has no authority or power to make such a request, and it would be an unlawful act to do so. And certainly on my part, it would be a violation of the Constitution to be a party to any such thing. It is totally unnecessary. There are persons within the office of the DPP who are experienced and competent and diligent. And they, one of them, and it's not for me to say who that should be, one of those persons should be appointed immediately to act as DPP, and the procedure to appoint a new DPP must also be initiated forthwith. That is what the Constitution requires at this time. 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, members of the media. Thank you for your time. All the best. Have a good weekend.